Uh, let me just start off this week with a prayer. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for loving us and for caring for us. And thank you so much for taking us through this mess thus far. I pray that you watch over our students, uh, bless them and keep them on their families, oh God. Help them to know that we do care about them and uh, we pray for them all the time. Watch over them as they study for the next three weeks. Uh, pretty soon it'll be all over before finals. Help them to stay focused and to be disciplined and keep them safe and well, oh God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, guys, let me just set up a few things for you today. Uh, today, I'll, in fact, before I actually start, did we talk about COVID-19 last week? Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah, the reason why I could not give a lecture on Friday, I have three lectures, and uh, yeah, for some reason I could not be here because of an emergency, and I did not give a lecture on Friday, so I'm just kind of disconcerted as far as where I stopped, but I was pretty sure we're uh, done with uh, neurotrophic diseases. Let me start the recording session here. Okay. So I sent an email to you guys this morning. Uh, exam three, I'm sorry, exam four would be next Wednesday. All right, two chapters only. So today we're gonna cover the last part of the, that second chapter is on dermatrophic viruses. So again, exam four next Wednesday, two chapters on viruses, the basic introductory stuff, viruses, uh, structure, capsids, envelopes, all that stuff, viroids, and then, of course, prion disease. Last time we talked about pneumotrophic viruses. So we talked about influenza, COVID-19, hantavirus. And then the last part uh, of viral lecture for that exam would be this one here. So I'm going to start this one and finish it off today, actually. So by today, we're done with the materials for your exam four. There's one more chapter on viruses. It's chapter 17. That's not included in uh, exam two. That's included in the final exam, all right? Okay, guys, do you guys have any questions for me before I go, uh, any, uh, before I move on with this lecture? Anything I can answer for you real fast? Yeah, Professor. Um, yeah, go for it. For the final, is it going to be scheduled on a, on a certain day that it would, you know, wouldn't be our normal uh, class hours, or how does that work? No, so there's a final, uh, there's a final day that's posted in your syllabus. I can't tell you what that is at the moment, but it's going to be during finals week. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dig that up and put that specific date on Blackboard for you. Yeah, because I have three different lectures, three different days and times. All right. Also, too, is it going to work uh, like our midterms? Uh, say it again. Is it going to work like our midterms have, have worked the past, you know, quarter or semester? Uh, yeah, so this exam, it's more points. So this is one you can't drop. So you can drop one midterm if you screwed up on one exam for whatever reason. Hopefully that didn't happen. But just say you didn't study or whatever. You had other exams to study for. Uh, you can drop one of the midterms. So we have four. You can drop one. So three midterms for I take. Then the final, you can't drop because it's weighted differently. All right? I have a question. Yeah, go for it. How much time will we have for the final? Uh, it's two hours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a regular finals week. Uh, as far as your lab goes, as if you guys are still thinking about questions, let me just make a couple comments. As far as your lab goes, most labs will be done this week, right? So I, uh, if you notice, the, the syllabus is a tentative. So either this week or next week, but I think most labs will be done this week. I teach two labs on Thursday. We plan to get done this, this Thursday, so we have a practicum. And right after that, we have the talks. If we have to schedule another session for the talks, then we can do that too. But by next week, for sure, everything should be done for the laboratory. But again, most should be done this week. All right. Other quick questions I can address? To reiterate, Dr. Badeshi, sorry. Um... Our final is going to be on Blackboard, just like our midterms, correct? Yeah, it would. so the format is the same, same, but you can't drop your final because it's weighted differently. Got it. Thank so you. Good? Yeah, okay. All right, good. Okay. Ishi? Yeah, go for it. Um, will we have a study guide for our final? Uh, again, you know, I would just be telling you what's repeated on the slides. The slides are condensed, really. I take away from the chapters the essential things. 
So the, the, by the way, a good study guide would be like what I have up here right now would be the table. So I'd just be listing these all over again. Yeah. So it'd be just the first, I think for the first exam, I did give you a study guide because it was 10 chapters and it was actually 11 chapters and it was so broad. So I kind of focused you on what was significant, but these are uh, basically they're on topic. All right. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? All right, guys. So over the next uh, uh, week or so, so I want you guys to study really hard for this, these two chapters, chapters 15 and 16. Uh, things that you don't understand or I should explain a little better, let me know. And we go through this on Monday so we can do a review session on Monday, all right? Uh, so I will be done with actually this whole business for your, for your uh, exam for today which brings us to this, dermatrophic viruses. So these are viruses that infect the skin, <clears throat> all right? You're gonna see there's a lot of herpes viruses. When you think about herpes, the first thing that comes to your mind is genital herpes. That's true, but there are a ton of other herpes viruses I'm gonna mention here. They cause disease that might, we might not be even thinking about, all right? So I'm gonna list the major ones. Uh, cold sores is caused by herpes simplex virus one. Genital herpes by herpes simplex virus two. Neonatal herpes can result from either one of these two, but generally from herpes simplex virus too. Chicken pox, it's actually caused by a herpes virus, not the one that's transmitted by STDs or sexual con uh, contact. Um, then we have shingles, of course, can result from chicken pox infections. Roseola, you probably haven't heard about it too much. It's also caused by a herpes virus, it's called HHV6. And finally, there's one called Carposi sarcoma. See, we see this primarily on HIV AIDS patients. It's caused by a herpes virus called human herpes virus 8. Now, there are a couple other herpes viruses that do cause disease, but they're not skin disease. For example, if I say to you mono or infectious mononucleosis or the kissing disease, that's also caused by a herpes virus. It's called Epstein-Barr virus. And then there's a last one. It's called CMV cytomegalovirus, all right? So again, we're going to look at uh, the major ones that cause disease on the skin and some other sites depending on the patient. So I don't ask you too much about classification, but these are the major herpes viruses here. They're called HHV. That stands for human herpes virus 1 through 8. And it kind of lists the names of the type of diseases or the viruses that cause these specific diseases right here on this table. All right. Here's a nice little slide for you again. And again, I don't test you on uh, herpes family, I mean, uh, viral family names like herpes viridae. It just means a family of viruses and the important ones are listed here. In fact, all of them are listed here. Of course, we're gonna break them up according to sites of infections and signs and symptoms. So the first one we're gonna address is the herpes simplex viruses. And there are two of them that cause disease in humans. Uh, one is called HSV, herpes simplex virus 1, and HSV2. So first of all, if you take a look at the virus, it's a DNA virus. It's an envelope virus. So we've been talking about basic structure, right? You can see an envelope around this uh, virus. And then, of course, we have spikes. These spikes, they bind to certain receptors on cells, human cells. Many different receptors, actually, heparan, sulfate chains, uh, proteoglycans. So again, many different receptors, not significant for our study here. But what's significant uh, uh, as far as this, the life cycle of this virus? Here's what happens. The virus binds to these receptors on epithelial cells. They replicate, as you see, you produce viral progeny. Uh, these viruses, uh, they escape from the cell. The cell actually breaks apart. Viruses leave. And here's the important thing, all right? This is the really one thing I want you to get. These viruses can now infect neurons. Of course, when it affects neurons, basically they become latent. So they're kind of hanging out there. You don't see signs and symptoms of disease and given the right stimulus, they can come back out, move on, move through the axons and get to the site of infection to reinfect those cells. So uh, from the cells, from epithelial cells, all the way to the neurons, uh, it goes from the new, if you guys take an A&P 153, you learn the basic structure of, of neuron. This is the axon and this is the soma or the neural cell body. These viruses, herpes viruses, they move back all the way to the cell body. That's called a soma. And that's called retrograde movement. When they're activated again, they move forward. They move back to the epithelial cells. This is called anterograde uh, movement, all right? Okay, 
So let's talk about the disease. Again, remember what I'm interested in, names of viruses, disease they cause, and peculiar symptoms that's associated with them. So the first one is HSV1. So let me just take all of this business here and summarize it with the pictures here, all right? So this is the primary cause of cold sores. That's not to say it can cause genital herpes. Look, people practice oral sex, uh, anal sex. You can find these viruses at those sites. But most commonly, this virus is involved with cold sores. And here's you have a couple of individuals. You can see several different lesions. You can see this on the lip, all right? This is the typical thing that you see on the lip. That's a cold sore caused by these viruses or by herpes uh, simplex virus one. This is on the skin, multiple lesions here. All right, this is on the tongue. Take a look at this. Tons of lesions on the tongue for this individual. This is on the finger. And of course, uh, these are the typical signs that you see. So again, the primary disease uh, that caused by HSV1, it is cold sore. They're also called fever blisters. Let me just say these lesions here are very infectious. It contains hundreds and thousands of virus particles. All right. So typically when people, well, by the way, a lot of people actually have been exposed to this virus. In some areas, it's as much as 95% of a population. But in general, if you look at the U.S. population, about 67% of people on the 50 years old, all right, this is like 44% of the U.S. population, which is about 330 million people, they've been already infected with HSV-1. So we have this virus in us. Typically, when people have cold sores, maybe it's once every three or four years, maybe once every 10 years, uh, maybe you see it once and you never see it again because your immune system surveys it pretty well. But keep, keep in mind what's, what, what's happening here. When the virus occurs or reoccurs, it's because it has a latent stage. All that means it's kind of hiding out in neurons. It uh, doesn't pop out unless a stimulus occurs for it to pop out, but generally it's, st it's staying in the background per se and not showing signs and symptoms of disease. Now, you kind of know if you've had this before, and again, this is quite common, nothing to be embarrassed about, uh, so most of the people actually have been infected with this virus. But you know when that cold sore is going to appear. So here's what's going to happen. Let's say there's uh, three different stages back here. When the virus is reactivated, for whatever reason, it could be stress, it could be uh, people are taking immunosuppressive drugs or whatever. And uh, what happens is a tingling sensation that occurs right at the site uh, where this virus would pop up. And again, but why? Because muscles are activated. These are neurons. So you feel a tingling spasm, those spasms that occur back here. In about one to two days, basically you see a red bump that occurs. It's kind of itchy, but kind of painful sometimes because they're in contact with neurons. And this begins to blister, all right? And then well within about two or three days after, this is stage uh, three, basically you see that lesion, that, that blister is just filled with virus. And again, it's highly contagious. And then, of course, well within a week, it disappears. So this is a good time to treat. There are medications you can use uh, that actually suppresses replication. But the virus is still there. It's hanging out in the neurons. All right, so again, this is HSV-1. Let me just say, depending on the patient, so this is, again, pretty innocuous. People have these diseases. Yes, they're infectious. Uh, these lesions are infectious. But it can be more critical. Take a look at this individual. This individual has HSV-1 eczema. So again, that's not very common, but you see all these lesions here. It's not like just one lesion on the lip. It's more like this here. You see multiple lesions on the tongue, except this is on the face. This is where all the nerve endings are. So the virus is just literally popping off from all of these different nerve endings to create these lesions back here. Now, typically you see this in immunocompromised patients like AIDS patients. And we see that over and over again, right? But especially with viral diseases, uh, we can see problems like this. This is caused by HSV-1. In other individuals, we have about 400,000 Americans actually suffer from, from what we call herpetic keratitis. In this case, you have uh, lesions right around the eye. The cornea of the eye might be disrupted. But again, this, this could be a, a huge problem. Uh, the, depending on the patient, again, especially very young newborns in particular, this can end up in the brain. So something as simple to cause uh, maybe cold sores or blisters on an adult, you know, depending on the patient, is it HIV or is it a newborn? Uh, these viruses can cause some really bad problems uh, like encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, and meningitis, as we saw before, which is inflammation of the meninges. All right. Now, of course, when you think about herpes, the very first thing that comes to mind is genital herpes. And this one is caused by HSV2. Now, don't get me wrong. 
HSV1 and HSV2 can occur in the oral area or the genital area. Keep in mind different sexual practice, uh, practices. Uh, uh, people practice different types of uh, sexual uh, practices, right? So uh, think about oral sex. You can, you can have a virus ending up in the oral cavity. Anal sex or rep, uh, the, virus, the virus can actually be in the rectum or the anal area. It just depends on the site of inoculation. So first of all, before I talk about what you see in individuals who have genital herpes, let's take a look at the stats. It's pretty, uh, really, if you take a look at it, it's very fascinating what these numbers are. Keep in mind, all right, the population of the United States, again, I said it before, anywhere between 330 to about 250 million people. So U.S. stats, about 45 million people, age 14 to 49, they are infected with genital herpes, or the a virus that causes genital herpes. There's about 6,000 cases every year. But here's the problem. About 80% are unaware that they're infected. All right, so they have the virus, but they're not showing signs and symptoms, which is a major problem, because then they have sex maybe with multiple people, and you're just transmitting this like crazy in the population. That's a high number, 45 million. This is like one in about six or seven people who actually have this problem. Now, again, the virus is a latent virus, so it kind of hides out in the nerves. And there are many different triggers. For example, people claim sunlight or stress or anti-immunosuppressive uh, drugs can actually trigger this. People who have genital herpes, uh, many of them actually have recurrences. So it's a latent virus kind of hanging out or hiding out, right? So, but they complain eight to 10 times per year, they have symptoms like this, which I'll get to in a second. Complications again, just like we saw with HSV-1, depending on the patient, especially neonates, newborns, they can have some major problems like encephalitis. The virus is also linked to certain cancers. All right, so let's take a look at the lesions. This is what you see. This is your typical blister that occurs for HSV-2. Again, you can imagine that blister is filled with fluid, right? You pop that, it seeps of fluid. This is the early stage, highly infectious, millions of particles. So again, this can be transmitted quite easily. This is in the female vulva. This is the external female genitalia. You can see many lesions back over here, all right, and around the perianal area too. So multiple lesions on this individual. He has on the gland penis, this whole area here, all right? Uh, you can see the inflammation that occurs, but you can see the blisters beginning to form. Take a look at this one. Tons of them here on the shaft of the penis. And again, you see these lesions here drying up. And again, on the leg, female genitalia, all right? So again, these are highly infectious. Even when you don't see symptoms, you can detect, uh, you can take, you can detect virus particles and secretions. So really, when it comes to a patient who has herpes, genital herpes, it's always infectious. In other words, they can transmit the virus to, uh, to other individuals. The, the question is, how much virus particles or variants do you have well, of course, if you have obvious signs and symptoms with this reoccurrence, you can have way more variants present to be transmitted to other individuals. But nonetheless, you can even when symptoms are not being shown, you can detect that pathogen, this virus and secretions from the vaginal tract or from the urethra. All right. Uh, so again, they, they're, they're highly infectious. Now, a few other things I just want to mention. Uh, keep in mind, uh, typically for males. Generally, infection occurs uh, outside in the glass penis and, uh, and the shaft of the penis, but it can also occur in the urethra. So think about the types of symptoms that people would have, uh, males or females. If it's in the urethra, uh, you can have painful urinations, uh, for sure, painful sexual intercourse if it's on the glass penis or the vaginal tract or the cervix. So these are problems that can obviously occur. And babies, it could be a huge problem. So babies who are born to mothers with herpes, yeah, they, say they have these lesions on the skin, but keep in mind, if they acquire the virus, especially during development, that virus can replicate in the central nervous system. Heck, it, it hangs out in the neurons, right? So again, you can have major problems associated with the central nervous system. And that, that, that could be a huge problem. Luckily, it's very rare. Uh, typically, if it's known that the mother has an outbreak of herpes, guess what? Normal vaginal delivery is not done, in the, in the Western world at least. Uh, basically, cesarean sections are done. Okay, now moving on. Another herpes virus is the one that causes chickenpox. 
And again, I used to ask this question all the time. How many people have had chicken pox? Well, very few people raised their hands at this day and time. There's a reason why. In 1995, a vaccine came out for chicken pox, against chicken pox. Before 1995, the number of cases were from four to six million people who get chicken pox. Guess what? And this day and time, it's only 10, maybe 90. I think the current stats is like 12,000 people. Why? Because of vaccination. All right, so chicken pox is transmitted through respiratory droplets. Uh, basically, an individual get this. They go through this, these stages back here. So the state, this, this is day zero. You get this through respiratory droplets. The, the virus gets into the mucosa, the respiratory tract. At, so, at some point, hello? All right. Uh, is there a question? Okay, so about a week or so, what happens? The virus is spreading in the bloodstream. Then it goes, so this is what we call primary viremia. Then it goes to a bunch of different sites, including the liver and spleen. It replicates there. And then we have from there, it goes to the blood again. So we have secondary viremia. Viremia refers to virus, emia refers to blood. And then, of course, they travel to blood vessels and uh, the capillaries, and then of course we see these rashes on the skin here, all right? So this is what it looks like. These are, they look like little blisters, right? Similar, similar to what we see for herpes, actually. These blisters back there, you pop them, it sees this very infectious fluid. Uh, generally, most people, uh, they get over this pretty well, not much of a complication. There's a little kid, you can't see, he's not in pain, right? Uh, he's smiling, uh, you see these rashes on the, these blisters on the skin. And again, uh, not much of a problem. Most people actually recover. But you probably don't think about chicken pox like this. So he has a baby. This is a newborn. Or these are babies back there who have a very different form of this disease. So what do I want you to know from this slide? It can be very dangerous, especially for newborns. They don't have a, an intact immune system yet. So this is called a hemorrhagic form of chicken pox. Very, very rare, but again, can be quite deadly. The organism can actually end up in the brain, our central nervous system, it causes major, major problems. In other words, encephalitis. So, we talked about Rye syndrome already for influenza. We can see a similar problem happen here for people who have chicken pox or viral diseases in general, but who have been using aspirin. So, that's a link. And we talked about uh, Rye syndrome already. We also talked about Guillain Barre syndrome. This is where individuals start destroying their nerves usually because, primarily because of what appears to be an autoimmune response. Uh, acute cerebral ataxia, this is loss of coordination. Well, this can happen when you start destroying nervous tissue. And of course, encephalitis, swelling of the brain. So these are unusual conditions that can occur, but nonetheless, they can occur. Why? These herpes viruses, they tend to hang out in, in the central nerve, well, in, in nerves, for example, and they can make their way to the, uh, to the central nervous system, all right? Okay, of course, what can happen in people who have herp uh, who have chicken pox later on in life, if, the, if they haven't cleared the virus, they can end up with something called shingles. Now, shingles typically it's an adult disease. They've had chicken pox in the past, and now you have recurrences. Uh, uh, so uh, you see this primarily in older people. That's that's not to say you don't see it in younger people. Uh, uh, it can occur. All right. People describe this as a more serious condition. Take a look at this. It's not your typical lesion that you see. Generally, it's located in one area. This is where the virus leaves the nerve to infect epithelial cells. So these lesions are described as more painful. For example, some people describe this as an ice pick picking at their skin. Uh, you have a burning sensation, itching, numbness, and tingling in these areas, sensitivity to touch, and you see these red rashes begin uh, to form. Uh, it's, uh, the blisters actually contains the pathogen. So again, you can actually transmit this to individuals and now they can end up with chicken pox. It's the same virus, different type of disease, but again, highly infectious. Right? There's a vaccine, uh, but this vaccine is not very effective. It's about, uh, so again, in some studies, about 51% effective. And generally you give this to older people. So uh, you probably see the commercials on TV for, for varicella zoster or herpes zoster chick, uh, Vaccine. All right. Another herpes virus on the list is called HHV6. And again, remember what I want you to names of viruses and disease they cause and certain characteristics about them. For example, HHV6 causes a disease called roseola. A roseola, think about the term redness, basically produces these rashes on the skin. Uh, generally fairly innocuous. 
most adults actually have seen this virus before, so they're kind of immune to it. But take a look at this kid. I mean, she's got lots of rashes on her skin, right? Uh, generally speaking, uh, people overcome the problem in about a week or so. Uh, but in some individuals, depending on the patient, again, they can have high fever, like 40 degrees. That's 104 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a pretty high fever. Generally speaking, uh, most people recover. Another little link I want to put back here is this. There's been a number of cases linked to transplants, bone marrow transplants. So again, uh, generally speaking, most adults have been exposed to it. You have immunity to it. This is primarily a disease of infants and young children. It's a rash disease. All right. Now put a mark on this one. You guys will be nurses one day. You'll be working with HIV AIDS patients. You see them. You probably see them. All right. So HHV-8, uh, this is human herpes virus 8, is the cause of something called Carposy sarcoma. If you work with a patient who not just has HIV, HIV is the virus that causes AIDS, but now uh, the immune system is so suppressed that they actually have AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Uh, in many patients, this is what you would see on their skin, but really in internal organs also. So you see these rashes on the skin. They're not rashes, really. I guess you can call them a rash. But these are what we call angiogenic tumors. And again, they're induced by a virus, a herpes virus called HHV8. So the, what do I want you to know here? HHV8, human herpes virus 8. It causes Carposy sarcoma. You don't have to worry about the types. The most important form, though, is the AIDS-related AIDS, AIDS form. Four basic types. The most one I want you to remember is the AIDS-related form. <clears throat> it's the most aggressive of these carposy sarcoma. Now, you know, what you see on the skin, of course, is obvious, it's visible. But keep in mind here, these individuals also have these lesions, internal organs. So this is on the liver. You see all these purple, dark purple spots. This is in the liver. Uh, this is in the spleen, all right, right over here. Uh, this is in the gum area. So again, uh, you, you see these all over, all over there, all over the body. Another virus, it's uh, called a macaquin herpes 1 virus. It's also called a monkey bee virus. Let me just say this is very, very rare uh, that you see this virus involved with human disease. Like the name suggests, monkeys, primates are most susceptible to this. He has a, a rhesus monkey. You can see many different lesions here in the tongue, or on the tongue, and then on the lips. So here's how humans become infected. They actually work with these animals or just by chance they're bitten by uh, an animal that has that has the virus. Again, it's a pretty nasty one because when you end up in the hospital, the death rate is pretty high. It's like one in two people can die, all right? So again, this is not typical. We don't see this virus typically in human populations. Generally speaking, uh, they've been bitten by an infected animal. This virus can be present in the saliva of our, our monkeys, uh, primates in general. And of course, if you're so unlucky to have been bitten by an animal, you get this B virus infection, it could be very, very lethal. So very rare, uh, but quite lethal. How are you doing there? Sorry, have a seat, don't worry about it. Okay, so those are the herpes viruses. We're not done with the herpes viruses. We just talked about HSV-1 and cold sores. We talked about HSV-2 and genital herpes. We talked about chicken pox, varicella zoster, uh, shingles. All herpes virus, we talked about HHV8, human herpes virus that causes Carposy sarcoma. And then we just ended up with, uh, we also talked about HHV6 that causes roseola. They are all, all herpes virus. And then I showed you an unusual one, the monkey B virus. Not so common in human populations. Again, when people get infected, it's because they've been bitten by a primate who has this virus in, in, in the saliva. Now, there's a couple other herpes viruses we're not going to address here because they don't cause skin disease typically. That's EBV Epstein-Barr virus that causes infectious mononucleosis. And then, of course, uh, in an African continent, it causes a cancer called uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. All right. And then there's one more. It's called CMV. That stands for cytomegalovirus. But we're going to see them on Wednesday. They cause viscerotrophic infections. In other words, infections in organ systems. All right. I want to move on to the last section here of viruses that cause disease on the skin. And I list these tables are really cool because they help you to your study. Again, I don't care about all this stuff on the slide. Very few things I want you to name the virus, disease they cause, signs and symptoms, and tropism, right? Whether they infect you, whether you find them, and also their target, 
for example, roseola, typically infants and kids. Now, I want to move on to non-herpes viruses that can cause disease on the skin. So they are dermatrophic viruses. So these are the ones, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, papilloma HPV, human papilloma virus, in other words, warts and cervical cancers. And then, of course, I'm going to say a little about smallpox. We don't see this viral disease anymore because it's the only disease we eliminated from the human population. It is smallpox. That was done in the late 70s. And of course, one we, one we see more and more, it's a pox virus, not smallpox. It's called molluscum contagiosum virus. So again, these tables are pretty cool. Kind of focuses you for your study, all right? So let's go for it. Now, your, if you look at your yellow card, your vaccination card, yes, you see DPT, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. We talked about that before. But another childhood vaccination is MMR. I'm pretty sure some of you heard about this. You might even know what it is. This vaccine targets three different uh, viruses that cause some really severe problems in kids. Uh, by the way, in the Western world, unless your parents have not been good to you, all right, most people have been vaccinated. Believe me, you go to uh, developing countries, especially poor areas, they haven't had that vaccine. We have people dying, kids dying, because they have not been vac vaccinated and because they get, uh, yeah, measles. So again, MMR, let's look at it. Measles, mumps, and rubella. They're all viral disease. So that vaccine is available, it tells you right here, right? So before I move on, let me just show you uh, a couple of slides back here, and then we're gonna talk about this in detail. So here's a kid, this is a very bad case of measles, all right? You see lots of spots on the skin, that doesn't, this picture doesn't look normal. Most people who have measles there, yeah, they go about their daily lives, they might have some discomfort, but they recover. But it can be quite deadly, actually. In fact, just looking at some stats, all right? And I don't have more recent stats for you. But check this out. If you go back to 2012, there were 122,000 kids who died because of measles, something that can be prevented quite easily by this vaccine. So let's talk about these diseases. Tell you about the peculiar things I want you to know. In other words, you see this sign or symptom, you can say, ah, that's measles rather than, uh, say, uh, German measles or something like that, rubiola. All uh, right, so terminology is really important. The first one we're going to look at is MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. So measles is the one. All right. Now look at the name, because I don't want you to be confused. Uh, there's measles and there's German measles, two different viruses. Uh, two different diseases, all right? Both are rash diseases, but there are some things that are peculiar about each of those. So measles, another name for measles is rubiola, not rubella. Rubella is German measles. So measles, rubiola. So people get this typically by respiratory droplets, believe it or not, and the incubation period, depending on the load. In other words, how many, vi how much, how many viral particles did you get? Or did you actually get into your system? It can be about a week to about two weeks or more, all right? Individuals, of course, you see this typically with viral infection, maybe slight fever to begin with, sore throat and red eyes at first. And again, pretty soon before you see the rashes on the skin. So here's something I want you to know. A couple of spots, very, very important. You can actually diagnose this disease if you see these before the rashes occur. Hello? Are we good? Okay, so this is what a couple of spots look like. Now, typically, this is in the gum area, actually in the cheek area and the inner part. You see these little white dots back here? They look like little rice grains. And if you look real closely, you don't see that very well. They're surrounded by redness here. All right, so inflammation. That's compared to something like this. This is called strawberry tongue. We saw that before with strep and staph infection. This is not what's going on here with uh, measles. With measles, one of the telltale signs, a couple spots. Don't forget it. Uh, they occur about three or four days before the rash actually occurs. So again, most people recover pretty well, but I just told you, I just showed you some stats. People do die, kids do die from this disease. All right. Now again, this is the uh, a couple of spots versus strawberry tongue. Just to be clear on that, strawberry tongue is inflammation of the papilla. These are the tape, taste buds. Very different from these little rice grains that you see back here. All right, so, ah, uh, very different. Don't forget there's a vaccine for this. All right.
right, next on the list, as we go through our brief surveys, mumps. Now, by the way, I did have measles and mumps when I was a kid. All right, I remember that. I had dengue fever, which we haven't talked about yet. I had measles, I had mumps, and then there's something else in there I can't think about right now, but that's going to come to my mind. This is years ago. All right, mumps. So again, MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. So there's a vaccine for this one. Now, what do I want you to know about mumps? Something you probably don't have to worry about. In fact, I haven't heard about uh, recent cases of mumps. I have heard about measles because some parents were, guess what? They didn't do their duty. They didn't give their, their, their kids vaccinations. So for the past three or four years, you see these cases of measles appearing in our society, which shouldn't be a good thing, right? Again, because we talked about this earlier. People are afraid to give their kids vaccines because they think that causes autism. That's horrible. As a healthcare professional, you should never be in that camp. Nonetheless, uh, we do see a few cases. Why? It's because people didn't get vaccinated. Why? It's because their parents uh, had a dereliction of duty back here. So let me say, just say a few, what do I want you about mumps? What do I want you to know about mumps? First of all, the virus infects the parotid glands, all right? So generally one, you guys remember, you have three sets of glands, sal major sal salivary glands, you have the parotid, dang it, you have the submandibular gland, there's something else, uh, the, the lingual, sublingual, all right? So those, I forgot my basic anatomy here, but those are your major glands. Now check this out, because I want you to link this to something we talked about before. You guys remember diphtheria? That's caused by a bacterium, Carinibacterium diphtheriae, and this bacterium produces a toxin, if you recall, that causes cells to die, it prevents protein synthesis. But remember one of the one of the symptoms that you see in many patients is something called a bull neck. So that's when both sides of the neck uh, is swollen because you have inflammation, the toxin spreading, right? Now take a look at this one. This person has mumps. You can tell I remember this very, very clearly when I was a kid. One side of the neck is swollen. With bull neck, typically both sides of the neck are swollen with uh, diphtheria, right? So again, what do I want you to know? The mumps virus infects the parotid gland. Usually one, what it does, it causes inflammation. Basically, the ducts are sealed off and saliva food actually builds up in the gland and hence swelling occurs, all right? Now, that's one thing I want you to know. The second thing is this. In uh, young people, males and females, but this is a case for males, uh, what happens, the virus can actually travel to the testes. And of course, you can have some destruction of the testes, uh, in the testes. And that can, by the way, it can lead to sterility also. And it can also go to the ovaries in females. But generally, you see this more in males. This condition, don't forget the term, is called orchitis. So this is when you have destruction or swelling or inflammation of the testes, typically in younger people. All right? Again, that can lead to sterility. But this is a very rare condition. And you can see some pictures are taken from a kid we actually have this problem here, inflammation of uh, the testes and the surrounding areas. That condition is called orchitis. Other diseases, uh, can re other pathogens can result in a condition like this. Now, uh, so going back to MMR, we just talked about measles, complex spots. We talked about mumps, all right, parotid glands, orchitis. And then the last on the list for this vaccine is R. Rubella. So again, don't forget the terms. Measles is also called rubiola. German measles is called measles. All right. So this can be confusing. All right. So what do you see in individuals who have measles? Well, it's a rash disease. You can see rashes on the skin back here. That's typical. But what I want to point out really is uh, pregnant women and their fetuses. That's where the biggest concern occurs. So remember what we're trying to learn here. Names of viruses, typical disease they cause, and signs and symptoms. So again, this is a rash disease. We can prevent this quite easily with the vaccine. I've said that to you before, but here's the most significant thing I want you to know. Fetuses are very susceptible to, to, uh, to German measles. In fact, pregnant women, a uh, screen is done on their blood to make sure they have antibodies. In other words, hopefully they had the vaccine when they were kids, but to make sure they don't have this virus. Why? The virus can move to the placenta and it can get to the fetus. When it gets to the fetus, it can replicate in a whole bunch of different tissues, including capillaries. Uh, think about endothelial cells. So again, you can actually destroy capillaries. And of course, if you destroy capillaries, guess what happens? You're not moving 
oxygen effectively to tissues. And this is the developing fetus. Think about that. You need oxygen, you need nutrient supply to those tissues. So individuals who are born with uh, uh, rubella, uh, babies who are born with rubella, they can have some major problems, all right? You can see problems with the eyes, ears, cardiovascular system, the central nervous system. In some individuals, check this out. You expect this to occur in older people, cataracts and glaucoma. It's not unusual for fetuses who are born to actually have these conditions. Why? It's because of virus infection. So again, the most important thing I want you to know is this. Yes, German measles is a terrible thing. People get a rash disease. People recover. Most people recover. No problem at all. There's no treatment for this. You just run through the viral disease. There's a vaccine to help prevent it. All right. But the most significant thing I want to point out is fetuses who are, have been exposed to uh, to rubella or German measles. Major problems, uh, you start destroying fetal capillaries, hypoxia, low oxygen levels, uh, poor nutrient supply to organs, you have poor development, all right? Cataracts and glaucoma can also occur in these individuals. And by the way, microcephaly, that's kind of linked to a disease called Zika. We haven't talked about Zika, you probably have a Zika virus, but you can see microcephaly in these individuals also. All right, another terminology. Uh, if ever you have, we don't use this too much anymore, but this used to be used all the time. In the past, I still see it used here and there, blueberry muffin baby. So these are rashes on the skin and the newborn, a neonate. Looks like little blueberries, right? That's where the term comes from. So again, we see these purple rashes on the skin. Uh, and of course, this is bilateral cataracts, the cornea here, that's abnormal. That can lead to blindness. Babies with these conditions are horrible things. So bilateral cataracts and blueberry muffin syndrome, uh, these are conditions associated with congenital rubella. Remember, rubella is German measles. Rubiola is measles, right? Uh, moving on. So next on the list, yeah, so we're doing pretty good on time. Next on the list is fifth disease. This is also called erythema infectiosa, meaning it's an infectious agent. It's not just some chemicals got on a person's skin to give you these rashes. By the way, the common name for it is also called slap cheek syndrome. So he has a little, I hate that term because this usually relates to babies and I can't even think about that slap cheek syndrome. So anyway, he has a kid who actually has this disease, fifth disease, uh, erythema reddening. Uh, infectiosum is, is a contagious disease. So typically we see this in younger people between five to 15 years old. If in fair skin people, it's pretty obvious. All right, you take a look at this wall. You know, that's not a sunburn or anything. You can see multiple areas on the skin. People, typically people scratch the skin, they can transmit this virus from one part to the next. In any case, uh, he has a darker skin person like myself. All right, it's less obvious, but nonetheless, Highly, uh, well, I should say, innoc basically innocuous. People can have some major problems if they're immunocompromised or if they have other underlying conditions. But generally speaking, most people recover uh, pretty well, well within a week or so, all right? So you see this fiery red rash on the skin caused by a parvovirus, it's called parvovirus B19. So that slap cheek syndrome or fifth disease or erythema contagiosa. Okay, I'm going to spend a little more time on this one because this is a major problem that we see in society today. In fact, it's the number one cause of STDs. I kind of alluded to that when we started with bacterial STDs. I said, guys, you know, the most significant bacteria that cause uh, that are transmitted sexually, right? Chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And I said, we haven't talked about viruses yet. Well, we talked about herpes earlier. I want to talk about the next big one on the list, all right? So this one is the human papillomavirus. By some estimates, we have about 75 million people in the United States who are infected with papillomavirus. Think about that. We have about 230 million people. This is like one in four or five people have papillomavirus. It can be sexually transmitted. That's the most common route. But here's the thing, most people are asymptomatic. Of course, the most, you're gonna find out pretty soon, the most detrimental condition is cervical cancer. All right, over 90% of uh, cervical cancer is caused by papillomavirus. Okay, so these are oncogenic viruses. We introduced that term way back when. These are viruses that are capable of causing cancer. It's a DNA virus, and again, I don't care that you can memorize those facts. It has a pretty small genome, but it's a very powerful virus. 
and inducing tumors. I'll show you what I mean. All right. Point number one, there are over 120 different strains of HPV. That's a whole lot. It's not like just one virus. You have multiple strains of the same virus. So you can see we can, we can never develop a vaccine that, that actually targets all of them. We do have a very powerful vaccine that targets the most significant strains. And you've probably heard it before, Gardasil. All right, now there's Gardasil 9. Uh, the, initially, there was Gardasil that targeted four major strains, 6, 11, 16, and 18. Now there's Gardasil 9 that targets the nine most significant strains uh, of HPV. Now take a look at this. You have these in groups, right? These are the types of diseases they cause. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but we have common warts, generally by 2, 7, and 22. We have all these different types, but uh, this is the one I want to focus on later. Uh, cervical cancers, uh, primarily by 16 and 18. These ones here, these are the two major ones that cause problems, so vaccine actually targets that. And then again, some other types of cancers, all right? Uh, like oropharyngeal cancer, people practice oral sex, in all sex, we can find these viruses causing their lesions a different side of the body. Just like what we saw for herpes. All right. So the most common strains are 6, 11, 16, and 18 in the United States. There are some others over here, but the ones in red I want you to remember, right? Most of them are transmitted as sexual. All right. So these strains can lead to new growth. That's called neoplasia. That simply means new growth. That can result in cancers and tumors, by the way. You can classify these new growths into four different types. First of all, we have CIN, that stands for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, like you see right over here, that can lead, of course, to cervical cancer. This is the most dangerous or threatening of the diseases that we see. Uh, we have vulva, VIN, vulva, that's the female external genitalia, all uh, right? Vulva intraepithelial neoplasia, or VIN. Take a look at this right over here. You can see a lot of warts, all right, on, on the external female genitalia. And of course, in males, we have PIM, that stands for penile intraepithelial neoplasia. You can see warts here on the shaft, maybe in the background of the skin, uh, right, on the base of the penis, but you can see multiple warts uh, on the shaft of the penis. And then, of course, we have AIN, which is anal intraepithelial neoplasia. So those are new growths that's induced by these viruses. Now, a few other things I want you to remember. Uh, the number one cause, this is the worst case here, when people get cervical cancer, typically when this diagnosis already progressed in much later stages. In any case, most cervical cancers, over 90% are caused by viruses, not just because some cells in the cervix decide to go haywire and replicate like crazy. Most of these cancers are induced by a virus. It's a true, it's, it's an oncogenic virus. Okay. All right. Take a look at this other one, anal cancers. Most anal cancers, over 90% also are induced by these viruses. Vulva, that's an external female genitalia, about 33% of all external genitalia. Uh, uh, it's caused by uh, HPV. Penile cancer is about maybe 30% or so. Cancers of the mouth, less, and then of the throat. All right, so way less than we see for, uh, for sure, cervical cancers. In general, this is what we see every year. This is an old stat. I think there's about 15,000 cases of cervical cancers last year, and about 4,500 women who died because of this. All right, so the, typically, again, this is diagnosed uh, much later uh, when the disease actually progressed. All right. Now, this is to show you some examples of what we call unabated cases of HPV. If you allow this to progress, this is what happens. And again, you can't get rid of this. This is one of the diseases that you can't, once you have it, you have it for life. Uh, just like herpes, genital herpes, once you have it, you have it for life. So take a look at this. This is pretty bad. This is on the glands of the penis. And then this is on the shaft of the penis. This is in the anal area. All right. You can see the warts there. Uh, this is on the uh, gland penis and also on the shaft. You can see these lesions back here. That's growth, neoplasia, extreme growth. This is on the skin, and then this is in the throat area. Uh, you can remove these. You can use cryotherapy. In other words, you freeze it and with nitrogen, and then you cut it off. But guess what happens? Over time, it will grow back. Why? It's because the basal cells that form skin cells, keratinocytes, 
uh, it's infected. And once you have stem cells that are infected, basically you're going to have this for a lifetime, all right? So we can, use, we can remove this uh, using cryotherapy. Uh, we can use uh, chemical treatments like TC, that stands for trichloroacetic acid. And you can remove these surgically, but again, keep in mind, they will grow back because the basal cells are infected. Now, the last thing about uh, HPV is this. There's a vaccine that targets the most common strains that we have in the United States. This goes back to almost about 12, 15 years ago. The first four that were targeted were the four, uh, four most common ones, 611, that uh, cause warts, and then 16 and 18 primarily involved with cervical cancers. Now there's a, there's a vaccine, new vaccine actually targets nine. And I don't have that information here, but there's a new vaccine that targets nine strains. Uh, this is given in three doses over a year. And let me just say, like I tell my classes, doesn't matter if I'm teaching a class in micro or some other class, I said, hey guys, you guys are young enough. Sexual practices will occur. And I'm just being frank. It's best that you get this vaccine. If you haven't heard about this before, no, you've heard about it. Make sure you get this vaccine. It does protect you. I don't have stocks in the company that makes this vaccine, but I know you guys are this age where, look, it will happen, all right? Think about it. You have 75 uh, million people with, uh, with HPV. Most of them are asymptomatic. So again, this vaccine protects you against the most significant strains. And uh, you know, sometimes we tend to ignore this, but especially if you're a young woman, right? Think about this. I just want to point this out as cervical cancer. Typically, that, that, that's diagnosed well in about two to four, five years after the cancer starts progressing. And of course, that can lead to death. It's just one in three women who have cervical cancers die every single year. That's terrible. And of course, this is induced by uh, this, these viruses here. So that vaccine actually protects you against the most prolific strains that cause these diseases. All right. Now, I'm not going to say much about smallpox because we don't see this disease anymore. It is considered a bioterrorist weapon. But let me just say this. Smallpox has been a miserable disease to humanity over the past who knows how long. People wrote about this even before they knew what caused it. Millions of people have died. In 1966, the UN said, you know what? Let's get rid of smallpox. So this is, if, this is what happens when people put their minds together. So in 1966, this is a terrible disease. Let's eliminate this from the human population. In fact, it's the only disease that was eliminated from human population. No other disease happened. Next on the list would be polio, by the way, where we still see a few cases of polio every year. Nonetheless, I remember this because this is during my time. In 1966, I was four years old. All right. And think about this. Uh, I was 67, 68. Um, I remember lining up in my primary school getting a vaccine for smallpox and some other things also. But nonetheless, basically the whole entire population of the planet was, of course, inoculated or vaccinated. Of course, it's not 100%, because I'm sure there were not people who, there were people who were not vaccinated. But check it out. It didn't take long to eliminate this, this virus from the human population. The last case of smallpox we saw officially was in 1977. And then there was one or two in 1980 and 81. So again, by in the 70s, late 70s, we didn't see smallpox anymore. It's the only disease that we've eliminated from the human population. All right, why? Because of vaccinations. The very same types of vaccines people complain about because it causes autism. Don't ever believe that crap, all right? You guys will be health professionals. Hopefully, you don't believe that crap already. And now uh, this is going around in this day and time for the past 20 years. Ah, man, vaccine causes autism. No, that's not true, all right? So don't be in that camp. That's silly. That's not scientific. In any case, smallpox is the only disease we've eliminated from the human population by vaccinations. And if you wish to, if you would like to learn more about smallpox, I have this nice little table to, to go through that disease with you. Uh, just one more thing. Of course, it was eliminated from the human population, but governments are so stupid, they save little vials that contain the virus. So after 1977, the UN said, you know what, we're going to give some vials to the Soviet Union and to the United States. And they did. So there are still vials in store when the Soviet Union broke up about 20, 30 years, heck, almost 30 years ago. Uh, some of those vials went missing. So yes, this is considered to be a potential bioterrorist weapon. 
Luckily, we haven't seen this unleashed on humanity. Hopefully, it never will. Now, the last disease on the list is this one here. It's uh, one that we see more commonly now. It's caused by a pox virus. And this virus is called Molluscum contagiosum virus. It can be transmitted by many different routes, but one of the routes is through sexual contact, all right? So again, it's a pox virus, not smallpox. Uh, this is what the lesions look like. It's becoming more and more common, especially in younger people, uh, especially in athletes too. Uh, so check it out. It looks like a little volcano. This is how it's described. And uh, take a look at it right here. And it seeps, uh, sometimes it seeps this milky fluid, highly contagious, by the way. Nonetheless, it can be transmitted sexually or to direct contact. You can see multiple lesions back here. All right. And this, in this, in the shaft of the penis, here's one on the skin. This is around the eye. Okay. And then this is on the female genitalia and on the, on the thighs. That's molluscum contagiosum. All right. So again, it's firm, it's waxy, it's elevated. It looks like a little volcano, <coughs> usually flesh tone. Uh, sometimes they emit this milky fluid. That's highly infectious. All right. Okay, guys. So we're done with nomotrophic viruses. I just did a survey. Um, your exam, just to remind you, exam four, which is next Wednesday, two chapters only. Introductory chapter, that's chapter 15. And then chapter 16, which is on pneumotrophic and dermatrophic virus. All right. I'm not going to start the next section today. I'll, I'll begin that on, on when, in fact, I'll, I'll start and complete on Wednesday, so we, we'll be done with viruses. And that's on what we call viscerotrophic viruses. So uh, that's viral infections of internal organs. Okay, guys, so I'm going to stop here.